already. Yeah, but probably a very busy week for you uh, with many things going on, including the, the test. So I've got the test in my traditional way of throwing them out there. Hopefully you will grab them and uh, that'll save us a little time here. But here's what I'd like to do today and for the, the rest of the week as we are coming into the end here. Um, I'll start with the fact that I'm going to pass out the test. I want to look at some of the problems here real quick and go through the test. Uh, then we'll jump into chapter 13 um, on gravitation and we'll see how far that gets us today. Um, it probably should get us quite a bit through uh, which means we'll wrap up 13 on Wednesday and, and start a little bit into to 14. Uh, how much I'm not sure uh, but we'll just kind of play that by, by ear and, and, and see where we get. And like I said, we're going to shortchange 14 a, a little bit, but it is the, the uh, I guess, the nature, the consequence, and the one that's kind of planned to get shortchanged as we, as we uh, uh, wrap it up here. A uh, couple other activities happening uh, this week. Uh, you might recall on Monday, and I'll say it again, uh, our lab is uh, no lab this, this Monday. Uh, if we do get a chance to do the lab, I'm going to do it in class on Wednesday. It has to do with chapter 14, so I'm not sure we'll even, even get to it, but that was a long way of saying that uh, today uh, there is no lab. Um, mostly, it's not because we're uh, not there, it's mostly because, as I was mentioning, I've got uh, two very important meetings that had to be scheduled no other time than r right this uh, afternoon and they got to get done uh, before Wednesday. So that's the, the main reason. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to set it up with Don. And so I'll say it again, Don said, yeah, let's use this as a day for students to come and ask questions. So we're just going to call it an open lab. So I don't want to use the word canceled lab as much as open lab. So come to lab if you want, ask a lot of questions. I don't know where you are. Maybe you have other homework that's more important, but maybe you're starting to get ready for the final exam because that's coming quickly. So that's what's going on t today and Wednesday. Friday is the normal MC Friday, but again, you'll probably have a lot of questions. You'll want to ask Don because when's your final exam? Monday. Yeah, it's Monday and so that's why again this open lab today is probably a good thing because this semester you guys and this class turns out to be the very first final of the week. So 8 o'clock Monday morning. So maybe I should ask you, what time is your final? 8 o'clock. 8 Where at? Here. What time? 8 o'clock. Okay. And that's not the same time class starts, right? All right, so 8 o'clock, okay? Because I don't want to accidentally see you guys showing up here at 9 o'clock and trying to rush through the uh, final in, in an hour. You won't feel comfortable, okay? How many? Seven questions on the final? Yeah, seven questions are on the final. All right, so now going real quickly here at the test, I'll start here with the scores. You got your score back. Um, if, actually, if you got any score that uh, an A or a B, you should probably be very happy. It was a hard test. Pat yourself on the back and say, yes, I, I did it. You knew this was coming. You knew this was the hard one. It is the harder of the three. There's, there's no doubt about it. And so now you've got a total of your three tests. And now you've got a good idea of where you are going into the, the final exam. So I would ask you to do this again. Look at your three tests. Put them together. Figure out what your average is. Okay? Remembering that all your tests will eventually be 75% of your grade. Now I say all of them because you have done three, but you have a fourth one coming. In fact, it counts as, as a test and a half. So if you want to think of it, you've done three and you've got a test and a half. So you've done two thirds of your test, you still have another third which means your grade can go either way. It can go up or it can go down depending on how you do on the final exam. It's a big chunk of your grade. It's 25% of your grade. But since you have no other really way to figure it out, go with the idea that whatever you have gotten on the average of the three tests, let's just assume that's what you get on the final. I hope not. I hope you do better. But let's just assume that, that you get that. If you do, you can put this in and then you can put in your homeworks and your labs and you can figure out then your percentage. If 
you've been a diligent student and doing all your homeworks in the labs, that's easy. That comes out to be 100%. Then if I look at my test, I can put that in here and I know from, you know, the math here that if I had averaged 86 on these last three tests and I did all my homeworks in my lab, I put that into that formula and I get 90%. So there's your A cutoff. You got to get above an 86%. And I know that's not always so easy and A is hard to get. But let's look at some of the other grades. There are much... Uh, lower and I think much simpler. The B, 73%. So if you're looking at your test, you, you can keep your averages above 73% and do all your homeworks in lab, you can pull a B. Okay. Next level, and I think, I'm hoping anybody, a, a serious student got to get above 47 on the test. I mean, that that's that's an average that if you really work at, I'm thinking you can, you can make it. So the C is not so hard to get. The A is hard to get. The B, obviously, in between. But there's the, the breakdown if you look at my, my formulas. And I, I think you have, uh, many of you had me for 102, and it's the same kind of formula, the same kind of, of structure. Okay, a couple other things to go back. Here's some chapters 9 and 10. I'll send those around here if you want to dig through those. Um, also, a little announcement here as we get started into chapter 13. Oh, actually, I'm going to go over the test first. But here's the homework assignment from 13 if you want to grab one and take it. But I do want to say this, okay? This is more for you to do, not to turn in, if that makes any sense. In other words, I'm not going to require you to turn this in. I'm not going to add the points to the, to the grade book. Your last official homework assignment turned in, you've already done that. That's chapter 12, okay? This is to tell you that we've got one more major chapter and whatever we get into 14, okay? There will be one problem from chapter 13 on the final exam, guaranteed, okay? One problem. Chapter 13, final exam. Do I need to say it again? One chapter, I mean, one, one problem. Chapter 13 will be on the final exam. And the rest will be from the other chapters. So, you decide how much or how little you need to do this to make sure you are ready for that particular problem on gravitation. Because I know we got a, a lot going on there, okay? So, there's the assignment for chapter 13. Our, our last assignment as we get into this, to this last week. Now, looking at the problems, you will probably have noticed when you took the test, they started easy and got extremely hard. So, we got the whole gamut here. So, we started with number one. Uh, number one was hopefully an easy one for you. If you didn't see it, let me show it to you now. It is a conservation of linear momentum. We know that the momentum before the collision is equal to the momentum after. This is straight out of chapter 9, and so we had two objects. In this case, it was a bullet and a block. So maybe you went something like this. M1, V1 initial plus M2, V2 initial would equal then M1, V1 final plus M2, V2 final. There's our formula for conservation of momentum with two objects. The momentum before the collision equals the momentum after. And if you read the numbers here, they tell you the, uh, mo the uh, excuse me, the mass of the first one. They do tell you it's 22 grams. I'll do a little unit conversion to kilograms. They tell you that the bullet is coming in with a speed of 385 meters per second. They then tell you it hits a 100 grams, so I'll do a unit conversion, block of wood that is at rest. Say stationary, I think is the word they use. Yeah, stationary. Okay. And then the bullet exits after the collision with a speed of 105 meters per second. And the question is, what then is the final speed of the block. And so obviously the bullet has slowed down. Obviously the bullet has lost some momentum. Where did it go? Well, it must be here 
in the block. And so 61.6 meters per second is what that one calculates out to be. Two is a step up. You can see that here. We've got things coming towards each other and we've got them spinning, or at least one of them is, is spinning here. And so the problem is something like this. Here's this object traveling, say, in this direction. Maybe we'll call this M1. They say here it is a ball of clay. It is 525 grams. It is traveling with some speed, V1 initial, kind of like this one here. But they don't say the speed of that one. Then we have another object. This object happens to be a long metal rod. That metal rod is, of course, spinning too. And this says it has a mass of 255 kilograms. It also says it's three meters long. And it is spinning with an angular speed of 95 radians per second. So there's the problem and it says here they're out in outer space so there's no gravitational effects. So the first question is hopefully you ask yourself is linear momentum conserved? Yes, no outside forces. Is angular momentum conserved? Yes, if no outside forces then we get no outside torque. So yes, and we could even ask ourselves, not even needed though for this problem, is energy conserved? Oh, oh well, I better not cross it out. That'll look like no. But yes, it is too, but not, not even needed. It's, this is just conservation of linear momentum and angular momentum. In fact, it would be impossible to solve it this way because the unknown is heat and we don't know how much heat is created during the impact. Although what we could is we could solve this and then figure out how much more heat there is, which certainly is possible, but uh, not necessary. It's not part of the problem. So again, hopefully you did the same first step. You said the initial linear momentum is equal to the final uh, linear momentum. And so you put these two together. Oops, I forgot to say that the metal rod is not only spinning, but it is also translating at 200 meters per second. So again, it's a harder problem, but uh, the first part is not. The first part is the same as the chapter 9 where we would have conservation of linear momentum. So we would take the mass of the first one times the initial speed of the first one plus the mass of the second one uh, times the initial speed of the second one. That has to equal to the mass of the first one times the final speed of the first one. And then the mass of the second one times the final speed of the second one. And to make the calculations real easy on you, I just said they hit and they, they stop. I mean, they hit in just such a way that everything just kind of stops. And as you'll see, it makes the calculations very, very simple. We don't have to worry about center of mass like we did that harder one, number 36, on the, on the homework. And so here we can just say, look, we know the final speed. Both of them come to a, a stop. And not just a translational stop, but it also says a rotational stop, which is what we'll do next here. But we know that their final speed is zero. So this just becomes point 0.525 times the initial speed of number one, which we don't know. And then the uh, mass of the second one, which is 255, has a speed of, and I'll put a negative 200 in there, but whether you put a positive or a negative doesn't really matter. It, the speed of the ball is going to be opposite of that one. And you come up with 971 meters per second. So there's the first step, the, the conservation of linear momentum. The second step is then the conservation of angular momentum. And so as the two come together, you are going to say, well, the first one has some angular momentum, dmv, which came from our angular momentum is r cross p. Now maybe I should pause here because when we go to calculate angular momentum, this was the whole point of that chapter 11. Angular momentum as measured from <laughs> yeah, you got to pick an axis here, right? 
And you have to be consistent throughout the, the problem here. And on this one, maybe being a little bit different than the homework one, because the homework one had you calculate the uh, angular momentum as measured from its center of mass. And mostly because it was spinning around its center of mass after the collision. So this is not, so we don't have that same condition. You can if you want, because you know you can calculate it any axis you want. But I would suggest not. I would suggest that not bothering figuring out where the new center of mass is. We already know how it is spinning around the center of the rod. So why don't we use the center of the rod as our reference point? It'll make the calculation a little bit easier. But either way, you, you could do it uh, the way you want. So I am going to say here that this is the angular momentum as measured about the center of the rod. Okay, And so that's going to be my choice. And again, just my choice. And I think most of you picked that choice. There was a few who went towards the center mass. And I, that's fine. And I understood why, because we had done a homework problem on it. But uh, hopefully you've seen how this is a little different than the homework problem. So I think a better choice is not the, the, the center of mass. But it would still work here. Now, with that in mind, then, then maybe I'll draw a little dotted line across here. And so this is D. And that's what I tried to show with the little diagram on the test, that the D is up from the, the center of the rod there. Where, where does it hit? That's what we're trying to do. The find is where does it hit. So knowing this, this would be the angular momentum of the clay coming in. I'm going to throw a negative in there though because when I look at this now, I've got the R going to here and the P going to here and taking my right hand, R cross P, gives me an into the board. So the calculation is DMV as we worked out in class and as we did a lab on, but the sign is negative. And so it kind of makes sense. In other words, this wad of clay, when it hits, is making it rotate in a clockwise direction, a negative direction. So I would expect the clay to have some angular momentum. So the clay has some negative angular momentum. And of course, the rod is spinning, so the rod has a positive angular momentum. And so there's our two formulas for calculating angular momentum. One for a moving uh, point object and another one for a spinning object uh, with size. And this happens to be a rod, so we'll put that in there. But the final angular momentum is, is zero, right? They come to a, to a stop, both translationally and rotationally, okay? So it's the same principle applied, but I think a little bit harder. And so this is where some of you uh, got got stumped on this was this was obvious or maybe not and then this one was the other piece But this gave us the first question. What is the speed of the clay once we know that we can get this one? Which what is D and so let's put in our numbers here the unknown is D the mass of the clay is the 0.525 the speed is the 971 the rotational inertia of a rod is 112 times its uh, mass times its length squared times its rotational speed. And so the unknown is D. Solve for D. And so this is the 356 meters. Okay. Point. 356 meters. So again, both of them happening, conservation of linear momentum and conservation of, of angular momentum. Okay. I'll keep going then. Number three. Again, number three, hopefully you see right out of chapter 12 here. We got an object, it's got a bunch of forces on it. Um, but it's going to be stationary. And so if it's stationary, we know all the forces add to zero. We know all the torques add to zero. So drawing my free body diagram, and that's what I would encourage you to do first. Those of you who might have missed some points on here, look carefully. Did you draw the free body diagram? 
And there were a lot of people who weren't drawing the free body diagrams. And I get the impression that when you're not drawing them, that's why you're struggling. You don't really see what's going on. You don't really see the angles. You don't really see the picture. So I can't overemphasize. Draw it. So I'm going to draw just the rod, and I'm going to put the forces on here. Especially a harder problem. You're going to hear me say the same thing when we get to number five. I think if people just had drawn the free body diagram, they would have laughed at how easy this number five is. But it doesn't look that easy. All right. But there's number three where I'd say, okay, here's the sign. And so the sign is 125 kilograms. Which, of course, if we multiply that by the 9.8 meters per second, we are looking at 1,225 newtons. So the first force is on the end of the rod. Another one is just the fact that the rod has some weight itself, right at the very beginning. It says a 55 kilogram rod. So if you multiply that by 9.8, you've got another force, the 539. The one that's hopefully another obvious one is T, tension which they say is at 20 degrees from the horizontal. And so that one's tied right in the middle. And then finally, this one down here is labeled as the reactionary force. It has a horizontal and a vertical component. So Fx and Fy. And so there's the free body diagram. So again, look carefully. Did you draw it? Um, and I, I, you know, I got to admit, once you start getting more familiar with these, it gets a little boring drawing the free body diagram. But they really help. Okay, They really keep you, your mind in. Because this is the idea. It is just simply you know it's at rest. So what do you know about the sum of the forces in the x direction? Yeah, some of the forces in the x direction are zero. What do you know about some of the forces in the y direction? Zero. What do you know about the sum of the torques? And it's zero two around any axis. So pick any one you want and then set it up. And then it's just a matter of writing out the equations and solving. And I say just a matter of it. I mean, I know that's still a lot of work here. But it's, it, it's work that I guess is outside of teaching physics, which I'm trying to teach you. It's, it's now do the, do the mathematics. So just add up all these forces. I'm looking at this thing going, OK, here is the force in the x direction from this piece. And then this would have a tension, and it would be cosine of 20 degrees. And there's my first equation. OK? It's got an fx. It's got a t in it. If I go on to my y direction, I would see that there is a force in the y direction from this reactionary force. Uh, the tension then also has a y component pulling up. Uh, but then we've got that 539 from the weight of the beam itself. And then we've got the 1,225 from the weight of the sign that is then is hanging from the beam. So again, there's my second equation. And then the third equation is calculating the torque. And you can pick any axis you want, but I tried to emphasize, pick a, a, a wise one. This is a very good choice, because how much torque do you get from those guys? None. And hence, you get only one unknown. Okay. Now, maybe I put, should put some more angles in here. Because most of you saw that, but got a little mixed up on the angles. Uh, let's see. They say this is 50 degrees right here. So if that's 50 degrees, that means this angle in here is 40. Which means this angle here is in 40. Which means this angle here is 50. Meaning the whole thing then is 70. Okay, so now when I go to calculate my torque, and maybe I'll do the tension one first. The first thing is the distance, r. Well, that's two meters. The force is the unknown t. And then it's the sine of the angle between the r and the t, which is 70 degrees there, right? And so that's the angle. 
And that's why we did that lab on there. I want you to remember, don't confuse the angle as measured from the horizontal and vertical, the grid lines, as being the same as the angle as measured between R and F. All right, and that's why we did that static equilibrium one on Monday. It's real easy to mix those up, but hopefully by putting that paper on there and forcing you to calculate forces and then forcing you to calculate torques, you, you saw that and, and remembered it. So there's the torque, and in this case that torque would be a positive torque. It would be tending to pull it so that it rotates in a counterclockwise direction. Or if you want to do R cross T, you would get your, finger, your thumb pointing out of the board. So there's a positive torque. The other two torques hopefully are clearly negative. So negative and negative. They would clearly be pulling this rod so it would be a clockwise rotation. Or if you like, you can go R cross F. So put your fingers towards R cross towards F and your thumb goes into the board. So we've got one positive and then two negatives. Now let's do the weight of the beam itself. The weight of the beam itself would be a distance of two meters out. It would have a value of 539 and it would be the sine of 40 degrees. That's the angle between the R and the F, 40 degrees. And then likewise the sine that we're hanging is 4 meters out. Um, it has a value or a force pulling on it of 1,000. 225 and it too has an angle of 40 degrees between the the R and the F. So there's the real I, challenge of the problem. Write out the equations. Because now it's just a matter of math and if you've written them out right the math will work out right. I, I don't think the math is too difficult there but if you've got the angles all straight here, here the tension is 2045 newtons for T. Once you get that, you can come up to here and get the force in the X direction, which is 1,922. And also, once you got T, you can get the force in the Y direction, which is about 1,065 newtons. 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 Okay. And so again, right out of chapter 12. Number four, here's a rotation with a pulley. Now they're really starting to get hard. Four and five can really make you, you think. A four, you really have two ways of approaching it. I, when I read it, I think of energy right away. And, uh, and uh, I would have thought most of you would have thought that, but apparently it was about a 50-50 split. So it looked like half of you did it in terms of energy, and the other half of you did it in terms of torques and acceleration. And, but remember this, the key to these problems, I, I think a lot of time, are take a look at what they're asking and how they're asking you to get there. For, in other words, this one is asking for velocity, getting there based upon distance. That is a perfect energy setup. Okay, and so when they start talking about distance, think of energy. If they started thinking about time, then you're thinking more along the acceleration and forces, okay? Or if they ask for force or tension, as they will on the next one, on number five. You know, number five says, what is the tension? You know, what is the acceleration? Well, that would make sense to do the forces, but I would encourage you to do this one with energy. Uh, not to say it can't be done the other way, but it is a much harder problem if you do it in terms of torques and tensions and acceleration and all that good stuff. Either way, you have to get the moment of inertia of that uh, pulley. So we're going to have to work on that. But I would do it in terms of energy. So let me say initial energy is equal to final energy. And our picture looks something like this. We've got this five kilogram object and it rolls around this pulley that is kind of a spoke, if you will. It's got a rod, a rod, and a rod to make six spokes. And so then it turns a ring here. 
And so keeping that in mind, if this is the ground and we're two meters up, I would start off by saying five times G times two. That's my MGY initial. That is how much energy do I start with? Well, I start with five kilograms, two meters off the ground. And so now, as the five kilograms come down, that means the three goes up. And as it goes up, of course, the five and the three start moving, and so does the pulley. So I would expect this to become one half m1 v1 squared, a one half m2 v2 squared, plus a one half i omega squared, but plus an m2 g y final. And so that's where all the energy goes. Where does it go? Well, the five kilogram is moving, the three kilogram is moving, the pulley is moving, and the three kilogram has moved up. And so here's my, my v's. And so I'll put in my numbers here. Here's one half times five times v squared. So that would be my first one. And that's the question. What is the speed of that five kilograms right before it makes impact? And I would realize that, wait well, a minute, if that 5 is moving down, then the 3 is moving up. So it's going to have the same speed. All right, so there would be my second term. But again, it's only one unknown. Then it's 1 half. Oh, I've got I. Oh. So now here's where I need to step back and say, oh, here's chapter 10. Well, I guess the, actually the energy one's from chapter 10. You can see all this is right out of chapter 10, a rotation here. But I've got to get the moment of inertia. Hopefully you see that it is made out of a ring, so I would put the mass of the ring times the radius of the ring squared. But it's also made up of six rods, three rods, sorry, or six, you can do it either way, I guess, but I'll do the three rods, and so that's what it was described, as 1 12th m of the rod times the length of the rod squared. But there's three of them. And so that would be the rotational inertia of the pulley. And then as far as the uh, omega goes, that would be the translational speed divided by the r squared. And so the r's come into play here. And you can do some counseling or whatnot, but I, I didn't here. I just figured this number out and said, all right, what is that number? And this being a one kilogram ring with a radius of 15 centimeters. And these being rods at a half a kilogram, a length of 0.3 came up to be 0 0.33375 kilogram meters per second. And then, of course, my R is the 0.15 squared. So I know all these numbers, I just don't know the V again. So there's another equation, I don't know the V. And then the three kilograms have gone up to a height of two meters. Uh, so again, one big long equation, but the only unknown in, in it is, is V. Okay, so I'm going to write out the V and after a little bit of math, 2.87 meters per second is the, is the speed there using the uh, conservation of, of energy. And like I said, you could also get there in a much harder way with calculating the tensions in each of the chords, getting the angular acceleration, from there get the linear acceleration, and from there get the uh, velocity. And many of you did, and successfully did. And then finally to the wang banger of one, and this is just the tough one, 
Uh, and th I think part of it is just getting the picture of it. A lot of you came up and asked, which way is this thing rolling? So let's read it carefully. What does it say which way it's rolling? Down the hill. This is a big cylinder. I mean, it's 23 kilograms. Okay? And that's why it's going down the hill. All right. So make sure you got that picture in your mind here. That here's the cylinder. And it is rolling down the hill. Now, of course, what makes it a hard problem is it's not just rolling down the hill, but in the process of rolling down the hill, as it rolls, it's winding up this, I'll call it a cord, but I think they called it a, a tape. So, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that's why confusion is it's sticky. Uh, yeah, it's not like a scotch tape. It's more like a, but you know what a magnetic tape looks like from an old VCR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean this would be perfect for that. It's it's made out of metal, so it's really strong, but it's thin, so it can wrap up around that cylinder really easy. Uh, so this would be a yeah good use. So strong. Light, flexible, yeah, yeah. so I, I, I think that's what, in fact you're kind of wondering, uh, you can probably tell it was a direct photocopy, I, I didn't even type it or get my own one, it was just, this, this was on my test when I was in your seat, back when the earth was still cooling, you know, it was, I just made a direct copy of it and I go, hey this will be a cool one, I remember how hard it was, you know, I was like, let's, let's give him this one, uh, alright, so, alright, so. So I pulled it out and uh, grabbed it. So anyway, I do think a big challenge of this problem is just taking some moments to read what, what's going on. And this really fits that, that first step that I said in your problem solving. Step one, do you have a real good physical picture of what's going on? Because if you miss that, you're going to do some real crazy things. And you're going to do it the wrong way in the wrong direction and, and, and just weird. Weird. And if you, once you see the right picture, you'll avoid all kinds of other weird things here. Alright, so I'll say it again. You caught the, hopefully it says it's rolling down. So they're already telling you it's rolling down. And in the process of rolling down, you're going to mentally have to picture this cord or this tape wrapping up. And in the process, it lifts this up. Okay, so there's a relationship between this one moving and this one going up that we're going to have to think about here. The other one that, again, hopefully you got a good physical picture. Some of you asked me about, so it, it didn't look like that threw many of you off, but it, it clearly says right in here, it says the tape passes over a light, smooth pulley. What are they trying to say there? Yeah, it's massless. And what would you say about ma so this massless pulley? Yeah, that the tension is the, is the same. And uh, so a real quick discussion we had back when we did this. I mean, if we had tension 2 and tension 1 and radius r, the T2r minus T1r is the sum of all the torques and it have to equal I alpha. But if you're looking at something that has very little mass, then, you know, we can say that the I is essentially zero and therefore T1 equals T2. And so hopefully you caught that and, and didn't make it a harder problem than a T1 and T2. And it looked like most of you did, maybe a, a few more of you. Uh, Maybe a couple of you didn't see that, but a couple of you didn't come and ask me, and so I tried to clarify that because the problem in B does say find the tension. And I, some of you were bothered it was only singular. What do you mean find the tension? Aren't there two? And so there's not. There's not two. There's only one, and here's why. is because they're saying this guy right here is not really what the problem's about. The problem is really about this cylinder rolling down the hill while lifts that up. So we have translation and rotational motion here. Okay, so if you get that far, step one, got a good physical picture of what's going on, then 
Step two, draw that free body diagram. This one is absolutely crucial, you draw that free body diagram. Because if you're missing any forces, or you get the distance or the p placement of the forces in the wrong spot, it'll throw the rest of the problem off here. So, looking at the free body diagrams, and maybe starting with the easier one here, this one only has translational motion. And so the tension is pulling it up and mg is pulling it down. And if you write out this equation calling up positive, let's call up positive, so that it moves in a positive direction and this one rolls down the hill in a positive direction, I would call T minus mg equals ma or T equals mg plus ma and so putting in my uh, mass of 4.5 kilograms times 9.8 plus 4.5 times a there is my first equation. Uh, what is, I don't think I actually wrote that one down. 4.5 times 9.8. So this is 44.1 plus 4.5a. And I'll put a little box around it for my, my first free body diagram. Okay? And that's translational only. So that's really all the way back to chapter 5. That's obviously not what the problem's about. The problem's more about this one. Alright, so now Let's draw the free body diagram here. Well, clearly it has a mass, mg. Clearly it's touching the table right there, so there's a normal. But there's two more. Hopefully one of them's clear. Isn't there the tape itself? Okay, so the tape is wrapped up here. So there's T. And this one would be could be easy to overlook. What's it? Yeah, there's got to be some friction here. What kind of friction? Static or kinetic? Static. Static. How do I know? <coughs> it says it's rolling without slipping. Mm -hmm. So what direction is it? Yeah, and you might want to take some thought on this one. Make sure you don't overlook this one here. But that, it does have a force on it. And you know it has to be this way. I mean, one of it is you could say, look, just the fact that it goes down the hill. Forget the tape for a moment. But we talked about it without the tape in class. If it rolled down the hill, doesn't it have to have some friction? Wasn't it that static friction we said that gave it the torque that made it rotate? And so if you look at the translational alone, you would say, well, it's going down the hill, so the friction is opposite to the direction it's moving. That alone would tell you it's up the hill. But better than that, it's telling you it rolls. And so if you look carefully at this, this tension is actually doing what? Trying to make it roll this way, up the hill, isn't it? Isn't this weight essentially trying to make it go up the hill? So what's making it roll down the hill? Yeah. Well, okay, now maybe I should ask, it depends what axis you look at, because when we go to calculate it, we're going to have to calculate the torque, and we need to pick an axis. And I don't care which one you pick, but it's just like the problem we did with the angular momentum in number two. If you say you're going to calculate a torque, that's fine. A torque around what axis? And if you pick the center, then it's not gravity that makes it rotate. If you pick the center, then it's the force of friction that makes it rotate. On the other hand, if you pick this as the contact, then you would say it's the force of gravity making it rotate. So you can do either one, you just need to make sure you pick one and you stick to it and you apply your formulas accordingly. So, let's do that. Let's apply our formulas accordingly. I'll start with the translational motion. Since we 
are probably more familiar and that's probably an easier step. So we already did the translational motion for this one. Let's do the translational motion for this one. Let's look at the sum of the forces in the x direction. And my definition of x is down the hill here. So this is the x direction. Down the hill. Here's my axis. So just like I called up positive for this one so I can match it with a positive down the hill. Which of these forces are down the hill? That one has a component, doesn't it? And so if we take a moment to look at the angles, that is the same angle as the incline. And so down the hill is mg sine 30. So there's what's pushing it down the hill, a component of the force of gravity. What's pulling it up the hill? Both the friction and the tension in the tape. And then that would have to equal MA. So there would be my second equation. And I may or may not need that one. It depends on what you pick for your axis on the next step here. Because now I can calculate the torques. Now again, this was the whole point of chapter 10. Calculate the torques about what axis? Okay? And so that was what I was trying to say. Pick that decision first. What axis do you want? I don't care which one you're going to pick. Just pick it and know you have to pick it and stick to it. All right, so I see advantages of either one. Um, the center one, mentally I kind of like because it is kind of rotating around the center. And so I was guessing that most of you would pick the center. So I'll go ahead and pick the center. Although it's not the best choice mathematically because what did we learn about our choice here? How much torque would you get if you picked this point from that force? Yeah, none. And the force of friction would go out of the problem. That would be great. Because I would have an equation without the force of friction to match this equation without the force of friction. Two equations, two unknowns. So this would be a good mathematical choice. But maybe not as good conceptually. So conceptually, maybe I'll pick the center. But if I pick the center, I'm going to have the force of friction. So then I'll have one, two, three equations, three unknowns, okay? So I'll pick the center, and if I pick the center, then the torque I get from gravity is zero, and the torque I get from the normal force is zero. The two torques then come from the tension and force of friction. Both of them are at a radius of R and an angle of 90 degrees. I will want to watch my sign. One is obviously a clockwise and the other is a counterclockwise rotation. And to be consistent, I've been calling down the hill positive. So this rotation, counterclockwise positive, which is our tradition, so the force of friction is the positive torque and the force coming from the tension in the tape is my negative torque. But there's my torque. And that would have to equal to I alpha. And I is one half mR squared and alpha is A over R. So there would be my third equation. Um, I'm not even sure I need R in here at all. Looks like there's an R here and here, which would cancel with one there. And then the last one upstairs would cancel with that one. So I guess I'm not going to need an R. This would reduce down to minus T plus force of friction equals one half capital M A. And so, again, taking this as equation number one, taking this as equation number two, because I know the cylinder was 23 kilograms times 9.8 times
times the sine of 30 minus T minus the force of friction equals the mass of the cylinder, which is 23A. So if I put a box around that equation, I'll call that my second equation with the three unknowns, and I'll do the same thing here. Minus T plus FS equals one half 23A. Okay. But I hope you see something big here if you didn't catch this. Free body diagrams write out the equation. You're never going to guess that this is the equation between the force of friction and the tension. Never. And you're sure, and you're never going to guess that. There, there is no way you can just do this from the get. Eh, it should be a little bigger, it should be a little smaller. By what? Factors of two, three? I mean, there is just absolutely no way. And you saw that when I did those ex examples. I remember that day, all I did was for two hours was examples from chapter 11, where they were, they were rotating, that wheel was spinning and we dropped it down. They're not an easy one. And of course, that's why it's not easy. You're doing both translation and rotation at the same time. Okay? So, free body diagram, write out the equations, solve the equations. In this case, three equations, three unknowns. My tension is not negative. The torque caused from the tension is negative. Okay, so this is the sum of the torques. And so here's the free body diagram. Here's the torque. Okay, or here's the tension, I should say. If you imagine a rope tied to that point and you pull on it, what is it going to do to that disc? Which way is this one going to make it rotate? Clockwise. That's a negative rotation. Clockwise is our negative torque. So that's why I put the negative. So this is the magnitude of the torque. This is then the direction of it. Well, again, force of friction is up the hill. If you're asking about the force and the direction, I would say the force is in the negative direction. It's up the hill. But the torque that it produces is positive. Because which way does that force make it rotate? Well, pull on it. Which way would this rotate? Counterclockwise. Okay? So a torque, maybe another picture would be helpful here. If I just took a rod and put a nail through it and I pulled a force and compared that to here, both of these forces are in the same direction. Both of these forces are positive, but their torques are different. This one makes it rotate counterclockwise. This one makes it rotate clockwise. So the sign you have for your force is not necessarily the same sign you have as your torque. Those are separate ideas, force and torque. Forces make translational motion. Torques make rotational motion. Both are happening at the same time. Now you made in the minus tension, minus friction. Is that because your acceleration would be negative? I'm not going Here? Yeah. Is that because your acceleration would be negative and you would put a positive, positive on the energy? No, well, I, I would put it this. Forget this. I would just look at my uh, free body diagram. Calling this way positive. What direction are these two forces? Yeah, I understand the, how you got it set up, because, but why did you make, why did you set it, make it down positive? Oh, only because the problem said it rolls down the hill. Oh, okay. And I decided to call down the hill positive. I could have called down the hill negative, and then everything would be moving in the negative direction. Yeah. But just, that was, that was A, just a choice. But I encourage you to, if you know which way it's going, call that direction positive. You know, they, all right, well, if you got that one right, or even somewhat close to being right, you could probably, if you got it right, you get two pads. If you get one close to right, you get a pad. Because yeah. it was, it was a, it was a, it was a good, a good and uh, challenging problem. Both at the same time. I think it's the hardest thing we do this semester. I would not say it's the hardest thing we do next semester. In fact, it's going to make next semester look easy. I, I shouldn't say that. Okay, have a good summer first. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I will then start.
and see how far we get here into chapter 13. And see what we can have. You might also be happy to learn here that uh, this chapter is not quite this difficult. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, it's not easy. I don't think any of the chapters we do are easy. At least when we do them, we can look back on them and probably now say they're easy. I bet if you're looking back on chapter one and remembering converting inches into centimeters, thinking, hmm, that's an easy chapter. And uh, you probably weren't thinking it was hard at the time, but probably not thinking it was easy either here. And then we got into chapter one, that one dimensional motion, constant acceleration, or well, chapter two I mean here. So, good news in all that is remember the final exam covers everything. So, one or two of those problems are going to be way back in those first chapters one through four. Yeah, all right. <laughs> But I guess that also means one chapter is going to be like this one out of chapter 11 where it's rolling and we got translation and rotational motion at the same time. So plan on that one too. Right? So and everything in between. Alright, well here's where I want to get started. It's our last chapter. It's on our mechanics. It has to do with gravity in a little more detail. It was discovered by Newton, so hence it's called Newton's Universal Law of Gravity. Uh, you can say this is both an easy chapter or a hard chapter. I like to say it's an easy chapter because there's only one major discovery here. That's it. But the consequences of that are far-reaching, so we got to spend quite a bit of time here. But this is what Newton discovered. He said, look, if you take two objects, so let me call this object number one, and you take a second object, object number two, and I'll just draw them as round objects. They could be any objects, as I will soon say, but Newton was describing them in terms of the planet, so we like to give all of our examples in terms of planetary motion. But it's, but it's far bigger than that. And he, and he simply says this, that if you were to look at these two objects, there would be a force from number two on number one. And it comes from what we are going to refer to as gravity. And I don't know what two objects you want to call these. Maybe we should call them the sun and the earth just to have something to discuss on here. But does the sun put a force on the earth? Yeah, and that is done by this thing called gravity. And that's what we're going to discover. But it could be the earth and the moon, right? It could be the earth and the apple. It could be the uh, planet Venus and the planet Mercury. Is there a force between those two? Yeah, yeah. and hence that's why Newton calls it the universal law of gravity. Trying to emphasize it's not just something special about the earth or special about the earth and the sun. It's true for any sets of objects. And you have any two objects, they're going to put a force on them. And so we will use this notation that the force from number two on number one. And now you were introduced to that notation back in chapter five. And likewise here, there would be a force then from um, number one on number two. How would these two forces compare? Yeah, and so if we use Newton's third law of motion, we can say that those two forces are equal and opposite. So all we really have to know is how to calculate one of them. And that's what Newton discovered in his universal law of gravity. He said, look, the force between number two and number one, not worrying about which one we're talking about. They're obviously equal and opposite in direction. He says, then, is made up of what? Well, it depends on how much mass they have. So he starts off by saying M1 and M2, where this is just simply the, the masses. How much do they have? A product 
of their masses. But inversely proportional to the distance between them. And so if I then take the center of one and the center of the other, then this is the distance between them. And I do want to emphasize center to center. Okay. Since there would be a slight difference with center to center versus surface to surface. Now, fortunately or maybe unfortunately, I don't know, but when we talk about the planets, Usually, we don't need to worry too much about the radius of the planet. I mean, we're looking at, say, the planet Earth. It's got a radius of, what, like 4,000 miles-ish? But the distance to the sun is 93 million miles-ish. So, it's a, it's a small amount, and sometimes we don't even distinguish it. But if we do, and in this case, of these examples I have, we probably should. So, when I put them like this, I will not say their distance is zero. Their distance is center to center. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I better deal with that. I was kind of <laughs> going to avoid it. Um, if they are perfectly round spheres, then it is both center of mass and geometric center. So there's nothing, the issue doesn't even come up. So if we're dealing with planets, but you got to prove that and so if you don't have round objects it's not center of mass it, and you can kind of see it here if I were to take say I'll draw it like a ring but I should call it a shell okay because it's three-dimensional okay so if you kind of have a shell here If I were to look at, say, how much force does it put on this little point, then these points are closer than these points. Fair enough? And these points are closer than those, uh, see if I say this right, uh, without doing the mathematical proof. Uh, but your author does, so I'm glad, glad he does. We're just going to be out of time with this. But, but he goes out and he says, look at a bunch of shells. If you look at a bunch of shells, then these pieces out here are further away. But there's more of them further away, so there's more mass. And they happen to be further out, as you go out in three dimensions, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. And the force goes down like r squared. So area goes up like r squared, but force goes down by r squared, and they balance. So something that is a perfect sphere is really nice. They happen to just balance them, and all of this mass is the same as being at the very geometric center. But it only works that way for spheres. If you were to take a rod and a point here, you would you know, cut it in half and be tempted to say, oh, put all of its mass at its center of mass. Well, there you run into trouble because you have just as much mass here as here. And so these mass being closer have a slight more force than that. So it would be the equivalent of all of this being right here. And the only way we could do it is by dividing it into little chunks and say a little bit of force is related to, say, the mass of this one times the mass of a little chunk distance squared added up from beginning to end like we did with our center of mass and our rotational inertia. So this is set up for another real good set of those integrals. But since we did a lot of these already, and we're going to do a lot more of them next semester, uh, I don't feel too bad about kind of avoiding them this chapter. So we're going to try to avoid that. But I will answer your question. Only if they're perfect spheres. If they're not perfect spheres, we got some calculus to do. But not unreasonable calculus. And calculus you, you, you've seen and calculus you could do. Oh, yeah, so then x would have to be the distance away. So uh, I just threw an x out there, but then the, my, my grid would have to be this, right? This would be my x-axis. So my first chunk of mass would be here, x. And then I would, maybe this would be a distance d away, so I would go d, and if this was l, 
then this would be D plus L. So I'd have to do an integral starting with my first chunk of mass at D and then in adding it up till I get to my last chunk of mass which is at D plus L. And the particle is on one? The what? So this particle here is at the origin. Right, but it's mass. Is, is that M1? Or M2? Yeah, that was M1. Okay. Yeah, that was M1. Are we going to do this on the final? No. So that's what I'm saying. You I'm, I'm glad you asked, but I was kind of avoiding it because I didn't want you guys to think I was going to do something like this on the, on the final. You'll see a couple of like these uh, in, the, in, the, in the reading. Okay? Well, you'll see it next semester, so where we pick up. If you're really curious, it gets even fun. Because isn't this a point and a rod? So what if this was not a point? So shouldn't this really be, say, another rod? So shouldn't this be a double integral? And so shouldn't I add the mass over this one and the mass over that one to get the total force between them? Okay, well, we'll wait until next semester before we do our double integrals like that. But, but for those of you who see it, I think it's making sense. We just, we just have to add up our force between any two chunks. But also, maybe I'll throw this as just a little cells gimmick here. You see how powerful your calculus is now? I mean, you, all you have to learn now is from very simple physics of what is it between two small objects, and then you can do any shape you want. All you have to do is take that point plus that point plus that point plus that point blah blah blah, blah an infinite number of times. <laughs> and fortunately we know how to add up an infinite number of times. That's why we have our calculus. So your calculus opens a big window of opportunity. I'm sure many of you noticed a big difference in what we did in 102 compared to what we're doing now in 121. And our physics is almost the same. It's our math that is way higher and allows us to do much more complicated problems. We've got our trig trigonometry, which we didn't have in 102. We got our calculus, we have 102. And now we can really, really do weird and, I mean, we can give our objects sh size for the first time. And you just did that on your last test, giving it size and making them both translate and rotate really elevated the complexity of the problem. So then are you going to prove the gravitational so, I'm not, yeah, I'm sorry, and I got sidetracked, I'm missing one thing, thank you. I wasn't quite done. Um, and there is the constant of nature, yep, which we give the capital symbol G for, not to be confused with the little g, right? The little g is the 9.8, I'm not saying that. And that number here is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, if we use units of newtons and we use units of meters squared and we use mass in kilograms okay and so that's what we call the universal gravitation constant okay and so there's our factors. Call it four, if you will. But this one here is part of nature. It's something we, we can't really choose. I mean, we can vary it a little bit only because we change the size of our units. Instead of using kilograms, we use grams or, or whatever. So it is tied to the unit. But there's something here, and the physics part is right here, that it's these three factors. What is the mass of the first one? What is the mass of the second one? What is the distance between them? You put that together and that tells you the force of it. And that's Newton's universal law of gravity. He's not trying to explain why there is a force at all. That'll take Einstein and 300 years later here. And so more on that later. What Newton is just trying to say and what I'm trying to teach you is this is what he notices from observation. He looks at the, the six known planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn at the time. And he studies them in great detail when he has this revelation that there is a force of gravity and it has the same behavior. It just tapers off as it gets further. How does it taper off? With a 1 over r squared value, he notices. And then that leads him to think that gravity is the same all over the place. And so, why is the moon attracted to the earth? Same reason. Why does the apple fall from the tree? Same reason. 
And so hence, this is the part I was saying. This is a fairly easy chapter because you want all the answers to this chapter? I'm done. You have it, right? There it is. This is the force between any two objects. End of story. Do they have to be planets? No. Would it be true for these two lead spheres up here? Yes. It might sound a little creepy, but would you be attracted to the person sitting next to you? <laughs> yes! Right? There's a gravitational force between you two. Right? That's why I always say, eat lots of cheeseburgers and you will be more attractive the more you eat. Because you will, <laughs> you will get more force between them. But, but th that really is the short story. Now we've got to look at some consequences and that's what we're going to do for the three hours we have left in the semester. Did I see a question? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're going to do next. Yes, yes. Let me hold off with that one, okay? But I'll say it again. And I know I say it jokingly, but I really mean it because, if, I mean, if you could get nothing out. I mean, I hope in 20 years from now, you go, you know, I had this class at community college. I don't remember a thing. But I remember this teacher, he'd always say, physics is about a few powerful fundamental concepts that explain a universe of ideas. And so that's it. I mean you go back, you could make a list and you could, you could write them on one hand. Don't during the test. But you could write, <laughs> write conservation of energy and conservation of momentum and conservation of angular momentum and Newton's three laws of motion and now finally this last and fifth one, the universal law of gravity. You could write all those. One on each finger and a thumb. There's the five things. That's all you did. You know and if you tell someone that they're going to go, really? And that was five units? You spent five units, 15 weeks, to learn five things? But, but, but you did. I mean, and, and that's it. But it's this one simple idea that, that, that keeps covering. And that's why I keep making that joke. You want all the answers? And it won't be the last time you hear it. You'll hear it all next semester. Uh, you want all the answers? To, you know, and I'll just give you one equation and one idea. And, and, and so that's it. So. Let's look at some consequences. You bring up the first one here. If all we wanted to do was find the force between two simple objects like this one, that's a 102 problem. That's way too easy for you guys. You would be bored doing that. I mean, that would be nothing more than saying, all right, here's one object, 1.5 kilograms. Here's another object, 1.5 kilograms. And let's give it a quick calculation then. How much force is on this one from that one? Oh yeah, and you need a distance, so let's make something up here. Uh, what does that look like? Uh, eight? Nine? Eight centimeters? Call it ten. Call it ten? <laughs> okay, call it ten. All right, uh, ten centimeters. A and so as I go to calculate this out, I would go 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared over kilogram squared. And then I would multiply by the mass of the first one and the mass of the second one. And then I would say its distance is, and I'm going to convert it into meters. And that's really what I wanted to show you in this. Why meters? Wait, isn't it the radius between them, not the distance? Oh, well, no, hang on. So why meters? Because a constant is in units of meters. Good. Now, what did, what did you say about radius? What's the whole distance between them? Okay, so from center to center. That's what's important. It doesn't matter how big the ball is. What matters is distance from center to center. Which, you know, you bring up one. I always wonder if we shouldn't replace this R with a D. You know, distance between them instead of R. Because R looks kind of like the radius of those. And I, I, and I, I don't know if that's what you were thinking about, but sometimes when you see that. But of course, you can also understand where Newton got it is he was looking at the planets. So his distance was the radius of their orbit as they go around there. So that's why we, he writes it that way. But nonetheless, when I get out my calculator, uh, 15 squared is 225. Oh, units, kilograms would cancel, meters would cancel, and I'm going to be left with newtons. Um, one-tenth squared, I think that's why you wanted the one-tenth, so we can square it. That's a hundredth. I'll move it upstairs. Um, oh, I guess I'm still going to need my calculator. 
uh, whatever, 6.67 times 2.25 is. And so that's 15 times 10 to the negative 11. No, thank you, 9. And then that reduces to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. Okay, so there is the force between them. Big number, small number. Yeah, it's also I think part of the reason why you might have a difficult time either believing it yourself or convincing somebody else. Are these two gravitationally attracted? <laughs> they are, but as you can see, the number is really, really small. So you don't feel them. You don't see them move in. But they do. And this would be the, the force on them. In fact, what you actually feel is what your question, what else is going on here? Isn't the earth pulling this one down besides pulling it over? All right, so, so this one is getting pulled over to that one with a very small force, but it is also getting pulled down to the earth. And could we calculate the force between the earth and that one? Yeah, let's do that one too. But then it brings up what you were saying. What about multiple objects? Well, multiple objects would just mean multiple forces, and then could you get the net force from multiple forces? Yeah. And that's why I said the only thing new is here, except you may have to apply it to many objects and then you may have to use your net force idea from chapter 5 and add up all the forces. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like, if they're at rest, what's the force that is counteracting the force of gravity between them? Well, in this case, I guess it would be the... Objects of gravity? It'd be friction. So the friction just, like, absorbs that? So this is getting pulled this way with a force of... 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. But if I did a free body diagram, then I would be saying that there would be a force of friction. There would be the force of gravity. And there would be the normal force. So there would be a more complicated and realistic forces. Maybe I should take it into outer space. Get rid of all these other forces. What if I just had these two floating in outer space? What would happen? Yeah, they would come together, right? There'd be a force between them. And so they'd accelerate, they accelerate. And I guess it would probably look something like this. You know, they start here and they go... <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, how quickly they come together is... Uh, I ran through that number one time. It's surprisingly small. I mean, it's still, it's still quite a few minutes, maybe even hours, but I was surprised it wasn't days of how long. I mean, I would have expected, you know, I'm thinking, ah, that's not that much. But it would be noticeable if you were in, in outer space, is, you know, how long does it take to, to get together? Yeah. Does this explain, like, affinity for, like, like, I know, like, water has, like, an affinity for, like, glass? Oh, uh... I'll say yes and no. I mean, this is, this is an attraction because of gravity. Those molecular attractions, either adhesion or co cohesion, is because of electrical forces. It's the same overall, and that's what the topic next uh, fall is all about. The forces due to electricity and due to magnetism. So we will add to that. So in some sense, I'll say yes to that, but... It, they, uh, the molecules of water are not attracted to each other because of their gravitational force. Uh, although they are that too, they're much more attracted to each other because of their electrical force. In fact, I was surprised to learn, I was uh, at a conference at UCSB, uh, well it's the same conference, but it wasn't this year, it was a year ago, so it must have been a year and a few months ago. And uh, they had it on planetary formations and uh, something I, you know, wasn't really ever studied. So I was, you know, kind of fascinated with them. But I was fascinated to learn this, that uh, one of the scientists had uh, calculated how long it would take for little tiny grains of dirt to be attracted together because of gravity. And it just, they w just wasn't coming together fast enough. 
In other words, the formations of solar systems and planets just didn't happen by the numbers and it was really bothering them. And then somebody threw in that the start of it was electrical in nature. And I guess that was an accidental discovery really uh, uh, on the space shuttle, International Space Station. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the experiments they did was to uh, take a big plastic bag and fill it with uh, salt and shake it and watch it come together. And they found out how quickly it actually came together. It started coming together much quickly with electrical forces. And so now they believe that the uh, planet formations are started uh, with first the electrical forces between little dust particles. And then they attract. Then they get big enough and then they're uh, dominated by the gravitational force. And so yeah, and then at some point the gravity becomes more than the uh, electrical. And, uh, and the guy I was having lunch with even told him, I, I hate to tell you the wrong number, but I think he was saying when it was a meter big. And so until the dust particles get about a meter, he was saying they're probably more attracted electrical. Uh, not sure if that was the number he used, but, but it, it was cool, I thought. Anyways, but that leads back to your question. But anyways, more on that next semester. Right now, our forces are only gravitational force. So let me continue on with this one. Let me do the other one to, to fill in your question. And like I said, I'll say it again, everything I do for the rest of this chapter is all based on this equation. Nothing new. Just the consequences and the difficulties of it. So I can extend this problem by saying, all right, let's take a look at what else is going on. And what else is going on is a force between that little tiny sphere and the Earth. And so there would be a force pulling it down. How would I calculate it? Well, I guess that's my point. The same way. Same way as any gravitational force between any two objects. I would put in these numbers. So let me put them in. I'll start with the G. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons meters squared over kilogram squared. Uh, the mass of the first one, I don't know which one you want to call for. Why don't I call the Earth first? Because uh, I want you to see something else in here too. So I'll, I'll call the Earth first. What's the mass of the Earth? <laughs> it is. And I, I don't expect you to have it memorized, but I do expect you to know where to get it. Where are you going to get it? Yeah, I guess Google's a good answer too. Uh, but the, uh, it is listed on the front and back covers. Uh, in your book, I can't remember if it was front. Yeah, it is front one. So solar system data. So don't be surprised as you're doing the homework as they go through and they expect you to need the mass of mercury and you're like, well, where do I get that? It's right here. Okay? Right? So there's one of the masses. So here is the mass of Earth. The other object is the one and a half kilogram little lead sphere I've got sitting there. But I really want you to see this. What's the distance between them? Meter? Two meters? Meter? Okay. So, it's like many of you see it. It's the radius of the Earth plus the height of the object, isn't it? Right? See, it comes back. Center to center. Okay? And the radius of the Earth, again, not that I would expect you to know it by heart, but it's a big number. You better include it. Okay, where are you going to find it? <laughs> All right, on that front cover, or you can Google it here. But it is uh, 6.37 million meters. And I suppose I better double check these numbers. Do, boom, yeah, good. Okay, and so there is the radius of the Earth. Plus... And in this case, I don't know, you want to call it one more meter? Some of you saying yes, some of you saying no. And that's my question. Does it really matter if I put one or two, three meters in here? No, why doesn't it matter? Yeah, that is way small. Look at what you're looking at, right? You're looking at six million meters. And now you add one, two, three. Four. Is it going to change it much? 
In fact, I bet you've even experienced it. You ever gone up to a chemistry on the second floor? Ever been in a building three, four, five stories? Do you weigh the same when you're on the fifth story? <laughs> Alright, so it depends how you want to answer this. Technically, you would, I guess, have to say, no, I'm a little higher, therefore I weigh a little less. You going to notice it? No, why not? Negligible to the six million meters. I'll even go higher. I bet many of you have been in an airplane. And I bet the last thing you thought about as you're sitting in the airplane flying along at 30,000 feet is, you know, I, I just feel like I'm 10 pounds lighter. I just love flying. I feel like I lost weight. You know, you get up a seatbelt and you run down the aisleway a few times. You, I, I bet you haven't even noticed it. Why not? Yeah. So, let's do this. If we're in the atmosphere, okay, why don't we just ignore that? Fair enough? I mean, is it technically required to be there? Yeah. But let's not put anything in. Let's not worry about three or four meters, even of three or four thousand meters. We're not even going to worry about it. So let's just say if we're outside of the atmosphere, anything in the atmosphere, pff, we'll just treat it the same. And now the reason I say that is what if I do treat this as a zero? And I put all these numbers together. What do I get? Yeah, so if you set your height equal to zero, you get 9.8 times 1.5. Well, duh. What have we been doing up to this point? Isn't that what we've been saying the weight of an object is? All right, so I'm trying to see why we got away with what we did. And what we did was a subset of something bigger. And so now let's see that something bigger. So anytime you're in the atmosphere, go ahead and use mg. And this is also my way of kind of warning you, you know, for the, for the final exam here. If, if you have a roller coaster, don't worry about calculating the force like this. Just use mg. Okay? If it's a satellite, use this. Okay? So, see that transition inside the atmosphere versus outside the atmosphere, okay? And so, this is what we got away with up until now. Now, we're going further. Now, we're going to begin to see that the force of gravity does change with distance. And it is getting less and less and less. So, since we are doing a calculation right here on the Earth, I will say for that object, the height is, I won't even put a 1, I'll just say it's 0. I'll get out my calculator, that would give me 9.8. 9.8 times 1 and a half, isn't that 14.7? And so 14.7 Newtons is what I'm going to get. Whether I do it with a simpler calculation like here, or whether I do it a little bit longer and take the squares and cancel the units and the higher and order exponent, I'm going to get my 14.7. Seven. So, the picture I have, as you pointed out here, then, is I have that little sphere, 1.5 kilograms, and it's being pulled this way at 14.7 newtons, and it's being pulled that way at... 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. Right? And so that's the two together, and that's what I wanted you to see. What? Is like an example? No, no, no. I, 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 sorry. It's, a, it's an extension of this sphere right here. So this sphere is being attracted to the other sphere, which uh, we did probably, what, 10, 20 minutes ago, with that much force. And then it's also being pulled down because of the Earth. That's this much force. And so what I want you to see is a more complex problem means we have to break it into chunks of pieces. Okay? And so let's do this one. This one is kind of boring to put together because I got one that's so big and one that's so small that putting those together is kind of useless and, and pointless here. But what if I change this? What if I change this to a problem that looked maybe more like three uh, planets or three spheres. Yeah. 
in the shape of an equilateral triangle. I'll just say they're 10 kilograms each. And just to make the numbers maybe a little easier, although I think I'm still going to need a calculator, let's say that they're one meter. Oh, and let me make it clear that the one meter is from center to center. What is the total force on the top one up there? Could you do that? Yeah, do you see how it would just be Newton's universal law of gravity twice? And then you got two forces, then you got to do the components. I mean, let's do it. And so it would look something like this. I'll take that top one and say, well, there would be this force, which I guess I'll call F1. Uh, there would be this force, which I would guess I'd call F2. And so the total force is F1 plus F2. So I've got the two forces I'd have to add together, right? In fact, I even made it easy on myself because as I look at this, what would you say when you start breaking it into its components? What would you say about the vertical and horizontal components here? Yeah, and hopefully you'll see, even though it doesn't really show it well in my picture, <laughs> that the horizontal ones cancel off, right? And so as I go to figure out what is the total force in the x direction, I'd say zero. And so the y is twice the y component of one of them, right? And so that would make it a lot easier there. And in fact, the y component is really g m1 m2 over r squared. There's the crutch of the problem. What's the force between 1 and 2 here, or any one of the forces? Times what? Okay, good. I, I, I heard it both ways. You could do sine or cosine depending on what angle you're, you're looking at. If you're looking at this angle, I guess it is 30 degrees, so you want cosine of 30 degrees. If you're looking at that one, I guess it's 60 degrees, so you would want uh, sine of, of 60 degrees. Uh, I'll do cosine of 30 degrees there. Okay. And so, there it is. This is the magnitude of the force. That's what I'm trying to show you. Um, this is the component. There's two of them. And then the x direction cancels off. Now I suppose to make it a vector, I might say it is in the negative j-hat direction, just to make sure I'm saying, hey, this is the y component, this is down. And so when it's all said and done here, the total or net force is equal to, and so I'll have a negative, and I'll have a j-hat, and now, I can put in uh, some numbers. Um, maybe, should I write them or should I just put them in the calculator? How about calculator here? All right, so there's a 2. 2 times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times, and the mass is 10 squared, distance meters squared. Made those a little easier. But the total force then would be a negative 1.33 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. So there's the force if, that, if that's all you have. Just three spheres set in a triangle, no other forces other than the gravitational force of those three spheres. Obviously if you had the Earth down here, then there would be, you know, a gravitational force between them and the Earth, which would be much bigger than the ones in between them. That's why up until this chapter we've always ignored them and said, ah, don't worry about the other force. No, the i-hat component is zero, right? Here. I mean, if you want, if you want me to write it, zero i-hat, I'm good with that too. <laughs> yeah. But that, yeah, that was that first step, that the x components canceled off.
Yes. <laughs> so, g g great question, because well, so far, I think we've done the easier stuff, right? We've said, okay, what is then, right now, anyways, what is the force between them? And so we got that new equation. But as you know, we've done the whole semester involving forces. So let's go back and we look at things we've done, in including uh, some torques, but we won't do much. Um, let's look at some other things too. But let's look at motion here, a lot of things. Because didn't motion make things accelerate? Okay, so let's take a closer look then. Now that we know force of gravity a little bit better, let's take a closer look at dropping something for a moment. When we, when we were dropping things, oh, way back in chapter 4, and you put an object up here, and you dropped it, what was the acceleration? Didn't we say it was 9.8 meters per second squared? I suppose we said it was in the negative j hat direction, right? We, we said that that was the g, or actually I guess negative g, j hat is kind of how we phrased it so that the g didn't have a negative with it. The g just had the number and the units. Okay, but didn't we say it was a constant acceleration? Do we have that anymore? Uh -uh. Well, unless we're still in the atmosphere, right? All right, so let's change the problem here. Let's change the problem and say, what happens if? What happens if we have the Earth here? And we have the atmosphere that is pretty thick down here and then tapers off. And maybe I shouldn't even say atmosphere because I don't want you to think that I'm after the air resistance. I, that, that's not what I'm after. What I'm after is if you put something way up here. Way above the atmosphere. Does it have an acceleration of 9.8? No. How would you get its acceleration if you said it had an altitude of H? And of course, more than this, I hope you'll see, I'm not doing anything new. What I am doing is putting the force of Newton's universal law of gravity together with Newton's second law. Watch. How do I get acceleration? Isn't acceleration just net force divided by mass? Okay. And so let me call this mass of the ball and this mass of the earth so I can distinguish them. So I'll do a capital M for the mass of the earth. And I'll do a little m for the mass of the ball up there. Don't ask me what a baseball is doing away above the atmosphere there. Maybe this should be an asteroid instead. But there's, you know, oh, that sounds dangerous too. But this asteroids come flying in here. I mean, here's why asteroids are very dangerous. I mean, what is the acceleration of this asteroid? It is not 9.8. Fortunately, it's less than that, but it's still a big number over a long period of time. It's going to go real fast by the time it hits the Earth. And... Uh, this would be something that looks like this. I would say it is G M capital M over what? Over mass. That makes sense? Isn't that just putting together this force of gravity that we're learning now, the universal law of gravity? This would be the G, the two masses. This would be the distance between them. Where this then becomes the radius of the Earth. So you take the radius of the Earth plus its altitude and you get its force. When you divide it by little m, that's kind of nice because what happens? Yeah, and so getting the acceleration... actually simplifies. Maybe I'll call this then a G prime just to kind of say it is the acceleration due to gravity. But is it 9.8? Is it more or less than 9.8? It's a little less, right? Could be a lot less. Depends how big H is, right? If, in other words, if H is zero and we're in the atmosphere, doesn't this come out to be 9.8? Okay, and so as we get higher, it gets less and less and less. So maybe up here it's only 6 or 5 or even further, 2. But as it gets closer and closer, what happens to the acceleration? 
gets closer and closer to 9.8. Is this a constant acceleration problem? So if the question was, you drop a baseball from 500 million meters up, how fast is it going? How do you do that problem? Would you use any of those equations for constant acceleration? No, absolutely not. And in fact, wouldn't you think about using it in terms of energy? Why would you think energy? Because I'm asking for velocity and giving you distance. So let's see if we can do that problem. Let's see if we can answer how fast would this ball be going when I dropped it from an altitude of H? Alright, that sounds like a good problem. So I would use the principle of conservation of energy, right? So what kind of energies would be involved here? Okay, I heard kinetic and potential. Uh, do we know the formula for potential energy? We don't know it anymore, do we? Did you catch that? You weren't going to say MGY, were you? Because where did that come from? Hmm, exactly. So, here is why I picked this one. This one clearly shows the consequences of the, the required redo that we must to readdress. Because we had this. We had the force is equal to mg. And what we said then is the potential energy due to gravity was the integral of the negative of the force of gravity. And we integrate it in the y direction, if you remember that. And what we came up with was mgy. Remember any of that from chapter 8? But my point here is, we had used this to get this. Can we use this? No. So can we use this? No. So let's relook at it. And this is what I meant by, hey, we're only learning one thing new, and that's this new force. But the consequences of that are we can't use this equation either. Okay. So do not use MGY. Unless what? When would we use this? Inside the atmosphere. So when would you use this? Yeah, inside the atmosphere. So again, especially when it comes to the final exam. If this is a roller coaster going up and down, and you know, it says how fast is the roller coaster going, and you want to use potential energy, go ahead and use this. Don't throw all that great stuff we learned away in chapter 8. I mean, that, th th those are still very, very useful. Okay? But if this problem goes beyond the Earth and it gets out of the atmosphere, then that's when the point is that we can't use this equation anymore. And hence, we can't use this equation anymore. So, what equation would replace it? <laughs> well, don't you see it here? Let's try it. So, in place of F, I am going to put G M1 M2 over R squared. And so now, in place of the equation for the potential energy due to gravity, I will put minus the integral of G M1 M2 R squared. Ooh, what direction? Ah, good, good, good. You guys see it. I'm going to draw a picture. So you did see it. Uh, I'm going to draw a picture right here. I'm going to erase that. And I'm going to put the Earth right here. And so maybe this is my object. And if you remember, we were saying the force of gravity is this way and we are going to lift it then say to that direction. So maybe I will start at some initial distance and finish at some final distance. Right? But I do want you to see something a little bit different and that's why I decided to redraw this picture here 
When I did it a moment ago, I kind of implied that I was starting at position zero. I said, look, get the potential energy. The potential energy is the integral of, and I had this negative mg in the y direction, and I integrated it in the dy direction. Oh, sorry, had another negative in front. But I've implied that I started at position zero. Where is position zero? Right, look carefully and here's what's going to drive some of you batty. That and something else. If I use this formula, isn't this formula telling me where r equals zero? Yeah, where's r equal to zero? The center. Is when I use this formula for mg, did I have the formula telling me where y equals zero? No. So couldn't you pick it? And we had this long discussion. The difference between the potential energy due to gravity and the potential energy due to a spring. For the spring, doesn't the formula tell us where x has to be zero? So once we do this integral, and came up with this one-half kx squared, we had no choice of where x could equal zero, right? We had to use x equal to zero where the original idea of Hooke's law said x equal to zero. Fair enough? We did not have that when it came to the force of gravity. That's why when it came to the potential energy of gravity, we said you can pick y equal to zero anywhere you want. It hasn't already been determined for gravity, but it has for the spring. Remember all that? And I went into that not only to help you with those problems, but to remind you of that when we got here. Because this problem is choosing where r equals to zero. So do you have that choice anymore? Can you say the surface of the earth is zero? No, where's zero? The center of the earth. You don't have that anymore. Keep that in mind, because I think that makes this one of the hardest parts of the problem here, is to realize that I had it before, <laughs> and now I lost it. And that's a temptation to, you know, do it the, the wrong way, and put y equals to zero on the surface of the earth. You can't do that, okay, for these same reasons here. Okay. okay, so this then is the force. The force then is measured then, and, and maybe, maybe I should put it on the surface of the earth. Maybe, maybe that would look better to you, putting it on the surface, because that's what I did here. I put it on the surface. But the difference is, when I put it on the surface, I can call that zero. Can I call the surface zero? No, so I'm going to put a little position here, initial position and final position. Now other than that, it's pretty much the same thing in the sense that wouldn't it be in the negative direction? Which way is the force of gravity? Towards the center? Would it be okay if I called that a negative r hat? I know we haven't used r hat, but what was j hat? Yeah, the y direction. What do you think r hat's going to be? Yeah, the radial direction. In other words, I don't want to just say the force is this way, although that is the negative y direction. I want to be able to say it is always inward. And so that's what we mean by the r hat. So let me give you a new symbol. Fortunately, it goes away, just like it went away over here. We didn't worry about it, but it's the negative I need to make sure you you have in mind here. So there's a negative. And then I've got to add up as I lift it in the radial direction. And so the same thing we did back here for the uh, gravitational force. Again, trying to really show you I'm not doing anything new, but it's going to look really different. And it's going to look new and it's going to look like I'm doing something totally different. And that's why I'm taking my time on this one. I think this is the hardest thing of the chapter to be quite honest. It's this one here. It's like why are you doing all this? Well, I'll tell you. Why? Because I can't use mg anymore. I've got to use this formula. And this formula is very different than the other formula. This formula picks already where r equals to zero. OK? 
Okay? And it's more radial, so we use polar coordinates instead of rectangular coordinates. But other than that, let's do the integral now. And when I do do the integral, again, you will see, oh, maybe I should put R direction. The R hats go away, just like the J hat. J hat dot J hat goes away. R hat dot R hat goes away here. But what I really wanted you to see then is this two negatives go away, and I get G. I get M1, M2, and then I get an integral from wherever you start to wherever you finish of 1 over R squared dr. And that is a very different looking integral than this one. Fortunately, it's still not a hard one. But it looks different. And it ends up with a negative sign. And that can drive you batty too. So again, another thing that I wanted to make sure you saw. So, so what happens when I do the integral here? What do I get? Mm, not cubed. Integral r to the negative 2 dr is... Negative 1 r to the negative 1 evaluated from starting to finish, right? So this would be a negative of 1 over r final minus 1 over r initial. So it's negative g m1 m2 over r final minus a negative g m1 m2 over r initial. And here's the end of the, well I shouldn't say the end of the story because I still haven't even done the problem yet. I haven't even dropped the ball from a height to H to figure out how fast it's going. That's, that's really what I want to do. But I just got to figure out the new formula for potential energy first and I have it. This is it. The new formula for gravitational potential energy then is that. And that, to me, does not look a thing like MGY. It's a lot different, isn't it? It's also a lot harder, so I would encourage you to never forget that we're going to use it when? Yeah, if you go high enough and go out of the atmosphere where it really matters. And so if we go out of the atmosphere, this is a more accurate formula. Use the MGY if you're going to be in the atmosphere. Don't, don't, you know, don't throw that away. But if you go higher than that, use this for the potential energy. Uh, oh, uh, I guess I uh, should have been more clear. Um, and I was... I, I guess I need to go back to here. I was... Yeah. Really back here, if I had done it a little more clear... I would have said the change in potential energy is from initial to final. Okay? And then we had negative of negative mg dy. So what we got was mgy evaluated from some initial to some final. So what we got is mgy final minus mgy initial. And so we called this the final potential energy and this the initial since they're the same formulas then we just said the generalized formula is MGY and then you can just put a final to represent a final and an I to represent an I. So the same thing here this to be a little more formal is really the change in potential energy so it's really the final minus the initial so this is really the final potential energy, and this is really the initial. If you look carefully at those, without the initial and the final, they're this formula. And so the gravitational initial is M, or G, M1, M2, R initial, and the final is G M1 M2 over R final. Does that help? Yeah, and so the general formula is this and then we can put initials and finals. And uh, yeah, I, I should have done it this way. I think that would have been more clear. 
Uh, because my point was just that. My point was to go back and look at chapter 8. Make sure we remember what we did so that you can see I'm not doing anything different except the formula for force is different and there's uh, some major consequences and one of those major consequences is we get a formula that looks different. And there's two other things. One of them is where is R equal to zero? Center of the planet. Okay? So not only does the formula look very different, but the R equals to zero, you don't have that choice anymore. And then the worst one of all, I think, is looking carefully at this. What is the value of the potential energy in terms of is it positive or is it negative? I mean, if I were to ask you to calculate your potential energy right now, could you do it? Well, maybe I'll do this one. I won't ask you what your mass is. So, could I give you the potential energy of that one right now? Is it a positive number or a negative number? Put it in. So here is this new formula. G, M1, M2 over R. Negative 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons meters squared over kilograms squared. Mass of the first one. Well, what's the first one? Okay. Um, okay, I heard both, so I'll go with the Earth first. So there's the mass of the Earth. The other one is the mass of the object. Oh, what's the distance away? Isn't that the radius of the Earth? Or wait, or should we call the, the surface of the Earth zero? So we should just call it zero. Can't do that, can I, right? Don't let me trick you. Right? I, I, I can't do that. Okay, and again, it's these three things I want you to see. Because, I, like I said, I think this is the hardest part of this uh, chapter. Not, not that anything in this chapter is as hard as the stuff you just did, but, but the, uh, the hardest one is to just digest this new formula for the potential energy and say, really? Is that really the same thing? And it is. All we've done is take this force, we've integrated it, and we've got a much different looking formula. That's number one. Number two, in the process, we've got to remember what the R means. And the R means the center of the Earth. So I can't pick R. I've got to use the radius of the Earth. Fair enough? And then the third thing is, look, this comes out to be a negative number. And I think that bothers people when they first see it. And that's why I want to talk about it. This is a negative number. I mean, it's going to be a big number, and it's negative. So I'll do it. It's 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 12, uh, 24, times 1.5 divided by 6.37 million squared. No, not squared. Uh, million. Enter. And I get... 9.39 times 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and one more, 7, what? Joules, negative. So, so here's what you're telling me. You're telling me that this one sitting right here, has, what is that, negative 94 million joules of potential energy. Is that okay? Does that bother you? And I suspect it does. It always bothers the beginning student here. But let me ask you this. I don't know if it's the negative or the big number that bothers you more. Why don't we start with the negative? What would happen if this object were to go up? What would you do here? 
you would increase that distance. And what would come of this number? Yeah, less negative. Wouldn't that be an increase? And so instead of being a negative 9, blah, 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 maybe it's a negative 8, blah, blah, blah. Isn't that an increase in energy? So is it, does that really bother you? Isn't it an increase in energy? Anytime you go up, isn't it an increase of energy? The only thing that we've done different is back here in chapter 8, when we increased our energy, we increased positive numbers. Well, really, wasn't that our choice? Couldn't we pick y equal to 0 anywhere we want? In fact, didn't we often finesse the y equal to 0 so it always was the lowest point was y equal to 0? What if we had always picked the highest point to be y equal to 0? What would have happened then? Then we would have only had negative numbers. And down here we would have very negative numbers and up here we would have smaller negative numbers. Can I say smaller negative numbers? You know what I'm saying? Sure. Okay. Look at that. We're going to bother you math people, I know. It's not a smaller negative number. It's bigger, right? Which is bigger? Negative 3 or negative 4? Negative 3 is bigger, right? So is that a smaller negative number? Or is it a bigger number? Oh, both. I like that. Okay. All right. So, I like to say it's smaller negative numbers, meaning it's a bigger number, right? And so, as this object is going up, negative 9 becomes negative 8, becomes negative 7, becomes negative 6. But, you know, you get the idea. And so, other than the fact that I have negative numbers, which is really only because of the choice of zero I picked, I'm hoping it doesn't bother you. So, here's what I'm trying to point out. is We are going to deal with negative numbers. Don't let it bother you. It's okay. We've got negative, we could have had negative numbers here. We chose to avoid them, but we could have had them. Can we avoid them here? No. Unfortunately, r equals to zero has been chosen for us. And a consequence of that is we've got to have negative potential energy. So that's just a warning for you. Deal with the negative. In fact, how high would you have to go to get zero? potential energy. Yeah. Infinitely high. You have to get further and further and further away from the Earth. Do you have a lot of energy when you get away from the Earth? Do you have a lot of potential energy? Doesn't it take a lot of energy to leave the Earth? I don't know. Does it or doesn't it? Because how much do you have? Zero. So, here's the answer. And we'll come back on Wednesday. But be careful with this. How much energy does it take to leave the Earth? Oh, it takes a lot. It takes so much, you have to get all the way to zero. So your total energy when you leave the Earth is zero. And doesn't that sound funny? But that's the consequence. Look how much you have. You have negative 94 million. That means you've got to give yourself 94 million more before you can get to zero. Zero is an enormous amount of energy using this scale. That's my point. Okay? And that gets confusing. Zero is a lot of energy. You have negative energy right now. In these cases. All right.